So what you're looking at is the Clips Forte 3. And I'm not sure about you guys, but it feels like every reviewer who's covered these speakers so far have developed a hard-on for them. Now, I got to admit that my experience with these speakers, well, it's been something of a journey. And that's going to be the whole point of this video is to share that journey with you all. But first, let's go ahead and address the elephant in the room. These are not budget-friendly speakers. They retail for $4,000 a pair, and that's what happens when you get something this large, that's designed, and most importantly, assembled in the United States. So now, let's talk about what $4,000 gets you within the Klipsch lineup. Let's roll that intro. All right, so I'm gonna kick off this review by giving you a brief overview as to what you get with the Forte 3. I'm gonna be talking about the driver configuration and what it is that Clips was going for with this design. If you're here for things like specifications or you want a lot of details about the speaker, just click on the description box down below and I have links that'll send you to all of that good information. Now, let's first focus on the driver configuration. Starting with on top, we have a one inch titanium dome driver that's housed inside this little horn. That's for the high frequency Beneath that we are going to have a 1.75 inch titanium driver that's in this larger horn that's designed to handle the mid-range frequencies and beneath that we have a 12 inch paper cone woofer that, you guessed it, is designed to handle the lower frequencies. And on the back of this speaker we have a giant 15 inch FU passive radiator which I will show off before I transition over to the next stage of this video. But now let's talk about what Klipsch was going for because I had the pleasure of catching up with Roy Del Gatto, a gentleman who worked with Paul Klipsch in the late 80s on the Forte 2s. And I asked him, so what is it that you were going for with the new Forte 3s? And to oversimplify the answer to a criminal degree, it's the same speaker, but better. Much better drivers, a significantly better crossover, and of course the horns are also significantly better. Just to give you an idea, the Forte 2 used what's called the second generation Traytrix horn. This uses the seventh generation Traytrix horn. So it's designed to be better in every single way, while at the same time doing what clip speakers are known for, being efficient, great with power handling, good frequency response, and just giving you this clean, clear, live sounding presentation. And of course, this speaker is designed and assembled in Hope, Arkansas, which partially explains why it costs so much money. So yeah, that's basically the overview. Now let's take a look at, back, look at the back, and then I'm gonna talk about how it sounds. You see guys, this is what I'm talking about. A big, heavy speaker that nearly breaks your back when you try to lift it. And then on top of that, you get this, a nice large, 15 inch woofer. It doesn't even matter that it's a passive radiator, it's still cool to have. And of course on the bottom here we're going to have our binding posts. Yeah, you're going to notice this cable here, that doesn't come stock, instead it comes with your typical brass jumpers. I just put this wire on here because somebody told me the sound dramatically improves when you replace the jumpers. I don't know about all that, but that's part of the fun of this gig. You try stuff out, you see what works, what doesn't, all that. Anyways, let's talk about the sound. Okay, so when it comes to raw performance, think of it like this. If your metric of good sound is the speaker's ability to recreate the sensation of a live musical event, then the Forte 3s are absolutely stellar because that's what they're really all about. These speakers are all about giving you tons of detail, a big sense of scale, great dynamics, really good power handling. They sound good at low volumes and at high volumes. And it's all about giving you the sensation of a live musical event taking place right there in your living room. To be clear, these aren't your typical refined sounding $4,000 loudspeakers. These speakers have grit to the sound. These speakers are meant to rock and roll. They're meant to be a lot of fun. Now, when it comes to the overall performance of the speakers and what you could expect, well, this is where things get a little bit difficult, and that's because these speakers are very sensitive to not only the kind of gear that you connect them to, but they're also very sensitive about how you position them within your listening space. For example, if you're somebody who says, I want kind of this laid back presentation, well, believe it or not, you can get that out of the Forte 3. Just point it directly out into the room, <coughs> room leave the grill on, and that's exactly what you're gonna get. However, if you like more of that bright and forward presentation and you want it to be right there in your face, 
you take the grill off, you point them directly towards your listening chair, and that's what you're going to get. So there's a lot of wiggle room when it comes to getting the kind of tone that you want out of these speakers. Still, everything has a sound, and in my experience, I would say that these speakers reside on the forward side of neutral. As I mentioned before, they project sound in a forward way, and there's going to be coloration to the sound. The upper mid-range is going to be prominent and a little bit forward, and the bass, there's going to be some warmth there. And that leads me to the individual elements of the presentation. And let's start off with the treble. So I admit that one of the things that I don't like about older Klipsch horn speakers or Klipsch speakers with horns is the fact that the treble can not only be bright, but very unrefined and outright sibilant. And I've come to find that that's not the case with these speakers. I mean, while they are on the forward side of neutral and tilted up just a little bit, they don't have that sibilance to the sound that I hear out of a lot of older Klipsch products. In fact, I would say it's pretty smooth. They're very, very detailed speakers. I mean, every single last little detail that your system is able to reproduce, these are gonna capture it very, very well. But it does have some grit to the sound. As I mentioned before, it's not the most refined listening experience. It's almost like the equivalent of a modern day American muscle car. It's just meant to be a lot of fun and it's meant to grip you from the very first listen. Now let's move on to the mid-range. So the mid-range is gonna have this great open and spacious quality to it. It's very quick, very detailed, as you would expect from the low mass driver that they're using, but there are gonna be some compromises, right? If you don't get them positioned just right, you are gonna get a little bit of that horn shout from this speaker. Now, I've been able to mitigate it in this room, but I think it's something a lot of you may experience unless you get it directly in that right spot for your space. Now, when it comes to tone, believe it or not, the tone is pretty good, especially when you consider that it's a little metal driver in a horn. Now, when it comes to vocals, I would say that vocals have this great and very realistic, if not even almost hyper-realistic sense of scale, but the dividends come in when you listen to classical music or rock and roll or anything complex. The mid-range does not get tripped up whatsoever. It can handle very complex passages without it all sounding muddy or muffled in any way, even at higher listening volumes. So the mid-range is going to be very good. And now let's move on to the bass. So the bass, when you look at the size of this speaker, you think, man, they must rumble but instead clips put priority over clarity and power handling over rumble so if you are a bass head and you want to just feel it well you're probably going to need a pair of subwoofers to get that done i mean don't get me wrong you get good bass out of the speaker it has really good tone but it's not going to be about that big low-end rumble now let's move on to the imaging so while these speakers are capable of laying down a pretty wide sound stage what really impresses me about them is their ability to have this rock center image in between the speakers almost regardless of how you have them set up and that sound stage is going to be very layered and these speakers are very good at giving you precise image placement within the sound stage and what you ultimately end up with when you add all of this together good driver integration uh, relatively smooth yet still forward top end and when you get a setup right all the benefits of the horn without without excuse me most of the major detriments of a horn speaker you end up with something that's just fun in fact, these are one of the few speakers that I've had in for review to where I immediately went to my music collection after getting them in the spot that I wanted, and I just went through all of my music. I wouldn't say all of it, but every genre of music that I have, I had the luxury of just going through and picking stuff out, regardless of the sound quality. I just wanted to listen to it because it's fun. And isn't that what this is about? So these speakers, when you get them set up correctly, they can be incredibly engaging to listen to. But nothing's perfect, so let's talk about those imperfections now. Okay. So while the Forte 3s are very good speakers, they definitely aren't perfect and there's a few things I need to go over with you guys before I wrap up this entire video. Starting with what I feel is the most important thing, which is the fact that these are not drop and plop speakers. If you think you're going to buy the Forte 3s, just haphazardly put them in your room and then immediately get great sound, then you're going to be in for disappointment. In fact, let me relay my own personal experience with these speakers to you guys. In short, for the first two weeks, I was really disappointed in their sound. Either it was too dull and lifeless, or it was too forward and, for lack of a better word, horny sounding. 
Now, it took two weeks of me experimenting with the positioning of these speakers, not equipment matching, but with moving them back and forth, moving them to the right and then to the left, experimenting around with toe in, grills on, grills off. It took two weeks of that process before I finally found the one spot to where the sound just gelled together and I was left with the kind of performance that all these reviewers have been raving about, I guess now to include myself. It takes time. Now, if you don't think you have the constitution for this, then these speakers may not be for you. But if you do, let me tell you, the rewards are pretty worthwhile. Now let's move on. When it comes to power sensitivity, yeah, these speakers are pretty easy to drive. Although, I don't know, 99 dB efficient with a eight ohm nominal load, it feels like these should be more efficient than they actually are in the real world. I would say ultimately a good place for most people to be is an amplifier that can output 50 to 60 watts per channel if you're using solid state or anywhere between 20 and above if you're running tube. Now this is just generic. I just want to emphasize the point that I don't think you'd be able to get away with a single ended three watt tube amplifier on these speakers. It seems like they need just a little bit more power than that. And then lastly, let's talk about the bass. As I mentioned earlier, these speakers have good bass, but there's going to be some people out there who are turned off by the fact that they're spending four grand on a set of floor standing speakers and may still need to buy a subwoofer or two to complement them. But that's the compromise you get. You want a speaker with good bass that'll go really loud, then it's going to have to give up some grunt. That's just what happens even at the $4,000 price point. Otherwise, they're pretty good speakers, and that leads me to my final thoughts. I figure the best way to wrap up this review is to lay down my subjective thoughts on the Forte 3s. And in short, I really like them. They're big, they're fun, they're imperfect, yet they do a great job at capturing the sound of music. Are they for everybody? Well, of course not. Yet for me, well, I guess you can throw me on the list of reviewers who have a hard on form. And you know what? I'm fine with that. Anyways, guys, that's going to be my take on these speakers. As always, thanks for watching, and until next time, peace. Okay, so normally this is the part of the video that I reserve for comparisons. The only problem is that I only have one set of speakers in the house right now that compete directly with the Forte 3s and I've yet to review them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save that comparison for that product's review. So stick around for that. Meanwhile, there's something important that I want to go over with you guys that didn't quite fit into the main body of the review and that revolves around the subject of equipment matching. Now, as I've said repeatedly in this video, the Forte 3s can be rather particular about how you set them up in a room, but when it comes to equipment matching, they are as easy to work with as possible. In fact, I've yet to find anything that sounds bad with them, whether it's my Sony AVI receiver, this little tube integrated amp that you see next to me, the Class D amps that I have on hand, the traditional Class AB amps, even my Musical Fidelity Class A amp from the early 80s. All of that sounds really good, and this is refreshing because it means you don't need to drop a lot of money on electronics in order to get good sound out of the Forte 3s. Now, they are pretty revealing and they do a great job of showcasing the benefits of using better gear. So if you have the ability to throw better gear at them, then you increase the odds of getting better sound. But it's not necessary to have an enjoyable listening experience. Now, moving on, let me comment on positioning just because I've said so much about it. I just want to share with you all what I've done in my room and what works with me. So basically, I spread the speakers a little farther apart than I would put most speakers in my room, only by a little bit, maybe a couple inches. And then instead of having them direct facing, excuse me, facing directly out into the room, I have them towed in just a little bit. I don't even know what the angle is. It's like just a little bit to where the horn's facing well outside of the shoulder area. And I leave the grills on most of the time just to soften the sound a little bit. That's what works best for me, but obviously you're gonna have to experiment around in your own room to see what works best for you. Anyways, guys, that's gonna be it. I appreciate you watching this video and tolerating the lack of production value. I tried to film in a different location just to break things up. That did not work out so well. I probably won't do that again anytime soon, but nonetheless, as always, I appreciate you checking in and uh, yeah, hopefully you got something out of this video and for real this time, I'm going to end this awkward <laughs> outro. <laughs> so, uh, oh man. All right, guys, I always lose it towards the end here. Peace.